Okay. Yep. Shall I start, I guess? You want me to introduce myself, guys? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, thanks again for having me. My name is Sumana Sohi. I am a gastroenterologist. So basically that means that my subspecialty is of the digestive system as well as the liver and the pancreas. Um, and I did my undergraduate at Harvard University, and then I graduated medical school from Tufts, which is also up in Boston. And then I um, did my internal medicine residency at University of Chicago because GI is a subspecialty of internal medicine. And then from there, I went to Rush University in Chicago for my fellowship. So that is all my training. I am a little over 10 years out now practicing in my hometown of Louisville, Kentucky. Okay, great. So can you just talk about um, some of like your pre-med journey and how you got into med school? Yeah, absolutely. So I always knew that I wanted to be a physician. I, um, I grew up, my dad is a doctor, he's a cardiologist. So I grew up around the hospital quite a bit. Sometimes he would take me into the cath lab and I would sit and watch him float the catheter and do angioplasties. And then I would, in the summers, volunteer in the medical library in the hospital. So I, I kind of always was always around the hospital and it just felt very comfortable and natural to me. Um, and so I always knew I wanted to go into medicine. So when I went into undergrad, I obviously wanted to fulfill my pre-med requirements, but the thing about Harvard is that it is a liberal arts education, meaning it's very broad. So while filling my pre-med requirements, I also wanted to get more of a broad education and um, get a concentration in something not very specific to medicine, because I knew that this was sort of my last, well, not necessarily my last chance, but it was a chance to explore fields outside of medicine. So I did psychology, um, which honestly is tangentially very related to medicine in some ways, but I really, really enjoyed it. And with psychology, I was able to use some of my pre-med requirements to fulfill some of the requirements for my psychology concentration, and some of them I just did extra. Um, so it worked really well for me. And then from there, I applied to medical school and, and went on from there. Um, I'm just wondering, do you have the list of questions we sent you? Oh, yeah. You want me to pull them up and just kind of read through them? Yeah, that'd be great. Would that be easier for you guys? Okay. Um, so the first question uh, you asked, which is what experiences impacted your decision to become a physician? I think I kind of already said that with regards to growing up um, in a physician household. Um, and then how was my pre-med experience in college? What types of activities did I do and classes did I take? So I think I also went over that as well. Um, what were some of the biggest challenges I faced during medical school, residency, and now as I practice medicine? That's a good question. I think a lot of times when people go on this path, it is such a long journey and it can feel kind of overwhelming to think. I remember when I was in college thinking, oh my gosh, okay, I will be done with everything by 2010. And uh, that just seemed so far away. And now that's like 10 years behind me, right? So I think, you know, it just, it can seem daunting because the path can seem very, very long. But, you know, the advice that I would give to people who are interested in going to medical school is to put one foot in front of the other. And you know your big goal, you know where it is, you know it's kind of far out there, but really making small goals for yourself and just kind of checking off that small goal as, as you go, each small goal, small goal, small goal, you'll be there before you know it, um, but it'll be less overwhelming. The analogy I use is that I'm a runner, right? And I live somewhat up on a hill and running back to my house after doing a long run of six or seven or 10 miles is running back up that hill is extremely daunting. But I break it down into little chunks, you know, I make it to one mailbox and then there's another mailbox and another mailbox. And so I like play that mailbox game. And by the time, by the time I pass all those mailboxes, I'm up the hill and I'm back at my house. And it's the same kind of thing, really like climbing the, the long path towards becoming a attending physician and in your own practice seems really long. But if you just break it down, getting from one mailbox to the next, before you know it, you're done. So I really would say that while the, a lot of the challenge can be mental, just the idea of how overwhelming 
it is that you have this long path ahead of you. But if you break it up into manageable chunks, it really ends up not being that bad after all. Um, one of the other questions you wrote is that what is my typical work day like? So the thing that I love about GI that I find really unique in many of the medical specialties is that you, your daily life gets to, you get to do several different things. So because it's a subspecialty of internal medicine, GI is very uh, cerebral, it's very medicine-based. You know, I, I have an office where I sit down and I meet with patients um, and, you know, I meet, I see three to four patients an hour for like the whole day. And that can be really great because that's where I get to establish long-term term connections with people, where I get to problem solve and, and go through all the differential diagnoses and all the stuff that is intellectually very interesting about medicine. But then because it's a procedural specialty, many days I get to do procedures all day, which are basically the procedures we do in gastroenterology are upper endoscopies and colonoscopies. And the nice thing about those is they're just super fun. Um, it's, it's like playing video games all day, basically. And it's, it's, so it becomes a really, and it's very fulfilling, right? Because um, you find polyps, you take them out, you stop cancer. And then many times I'll do a week in the hospital one time. So I was in the hospital last week. And then you have these acute issues where someone is hemorrhaging or bleeding and you're able to stop them and fix it. So it's a really, really nice balance, gastroenterology is, of having long-term patient care, getting to do procedures, and also getting to handle acute and chronic issues. So it's just, it's a pretty awesome specialty. I know the next question is, why did you choose gastroenterology as your specialty? And, um, you know, that answers some of that. I, I will say that going into medicine, I did not necessarily think I wanted to be a gastroenterologist. I mean, very few, I feel like very few people go in and think, oh, gastroenterology, because Unless you know it, people think like, oh my God, you're playing with poop all day. Like that's disgusting. But it actually, uh, you're not playing with poop all day. I never, I never play with poop. I'm not interested in that. But gastroenterology is a really great field for all the reasons that I said. So um, I kind of, what I ended up doing is rotating in gastroenterology when I was in my internal medicine residency. And I think as people go through and start um, going into medical school and into their residencies and starting to rotate, they'll start to feel where they fit. Each specialty, it's, it's a little stereotypical, but each specialty does sort of have a personality. And gastroenterologists are like funny and smart and relaxed. And it's just a really good, uh, there's a lot of camaraderie. It's just like a really, really good subspecialty. So I, I enjoyed that. Um, and when I rotated through, I felt like I really connected with the people and they seemed really cool and nice. And I still find that to be the case. Um, I'll also add that as a woman, uh, someone who knew I wanted to have a family and a good work-life balance, GI is especially that's very good for this. It's a nice daily balance of procedures, office and hospital. Um, it, you know, in terms of the emergencies, I don't get called in overnight a ton, you know, so it does really lend itself good it lends itself well to a good family life as well. Um, let's see what else you guys have asked. What experiences helped influence your decision to choose your specialty? Oh, well, I kind of did that, didn't I? Um, oh, describe a typical and or interesting case study. So I see the nice thing about GI as well is that you see a variety of things, like a huge variety. And so that keeps it interesting. Um, you know, I see things like functional issues like irritable bowel syndrome, chronic inflammatory disorders like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, anything from heartburn, ulcers, GI bleeding, hemorrhoids, constipation, diarrhea, abdominal pain. So it, it does become very, it stays interesting because there's such a variety that I'm exposed to on a daily basis. Um, I mean, some of the more common things that we see are like, I'll give you an example of somebody that I saw in the office a couple of weeks ago came in telling you they were having food getting stuck when they swallowed. And that's not an uncommon problem. They say like, you know, well, when I eat, basically when I swallow the food, they point to their substernum and they're like, it gets stuck right here. And then it eventually goes down or uh, I have to vomit and bring it up. And so oftentimes that is because of a stricture or a narrowing in the esophagus that can come because of reflux. The reflux or when acid washes up from the stomach into the esophagus, it can cause irritation and inflammation. And sometimes over time, 
because it's so inflamed and irritated, it can scar and it can scar down and become kind of tight and narrow. And so then when people chew their food and they swallow, the, the diameter of the esophagus is smaller than it should be. And so food will get stuck. So what we can do is we go in with our scope and we look and we can pass a little balloon through the scope and inflate it. And basically it presses out on the walls of the esophagus and opens things up so that they can swallow more easily. So that's a common thing. It's very gratifying because you're able to solve someone's problem very quickly um, and, and get them a solution right away. Uh, you guys also asked, how was your undergraduate experience at an Ivy League school? It was awesome. Um, Harvard is really fantastic. I, uh, it's just a great school. And I think one of the things that I like best about it is that there was just so much intellectual energy all around. You learn a lot from your professors, but you also learn a lot from your peers. I mean, the people around you are asking all these interesting questions and they're thinking very deeply about different things. And so it makes for really great late night conversations and um, it's just, it makes for really great small group sessions in classes. And it just, it, there's just tons of, tons of intellectual energy and it's, it's really fun. Um, and the last question you guys sent is what are some study techniques that help you throughout college and med school and how does studying in college differ from studying in med school? Um, that's also a great question. I think the nice thing about um, studying in medical school is that usually you have fewer classes at a time that you're kind of focusing on. So you, um, you can study with more intensity and learn that material more deeply. Um, and it's, I think it's laid out that way for that particular reason. So, um, but it's all about time management. You know, I grew up being a huge procrastinator and I would put things off and I learned very quickly in college that that worked out fine for high school but that wasn't something that was really gonna work for college and medical school. So I had to learn um, time management and not putting things off. So I, that's where I feel like planners are very helpful. Lists are very helpful. Um, I think a lot of people that go into medicine are sort of type A and very organized. And that can be really helpful in terms of um, laying things out and knowing what tests you have to study for when and what to do when. But I think organization will be key there. I think that's all the questions that you guys sent me. Um, I'm happy to answer more, but that's what I got from the list. Yeah, so I have a follow up question. So you talked about a lot about how like you loved Harvard, but were there any cons about going to that school? And did you ever face imposter syndrome in undergrad or medical school? Yeah, yes, for sure. <laughs> that's the most common. I think the biggest con for me, honestly, at the beginning was being so far away from home. When I went to Harvard, um, we were not as well connected societally as we are now, meaning I didn't have like a cell phone. Um, you couldn't Zoom with your parents or your high school friends. So it was, you know, you, you, I live in Kentucky, so it was pretty far away. And um, it was dark too, because it's in New England, it's so much further north. That was something, it, it was darker and colder and I missed my family. So that was really hard at the beginning. I mean, I felt very lonely and a little bit isolated. And yes, you do go in thinking, you know, you're, you were chosen, you surely can make it, but then, you know, you have people all around you that are doing these incredible things and thinking these incredible thoughts. And I think imposter syndrome is a common part of life for all high achieving people. And it's something that you just have to talk yourself through because that's, it's gonna be common anywhere. Um, but as you find your way and figure out your role and your place in different institutions, whether it be at college, medical school, residency, or when you're in attending, that, that goes away as you get a level of comfort with where you are. Okay, thank you for answering that. Um, and also, do you have any advice when it comes to like work-life balance, especially in medicine? Oh, I have tons of advice because I feel like that is really, really important. Um, I, and I think that a lot of times, once, when you're in college and medical school and then residency and fellowship, you don't really get a say in how much time you spend doing your work. Like you don't really have a choice. You really have to just work, 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 work. 
And so it is really important that you carve out time for yourself, for your mental well-being, for your physical well-being. And so I think it's really important that every day people should take some time to spend time out in nature, go outside, be among the trees every day in the sunshine just for a little bit. Make sure you get adequate sleep. Not always possible in medical school and training, but you know when you can, you should. Making sure you exercise and eat properly are really, really important. And then when you come out of the training and you're allowed to make these choices for yourself, make the choices. You know, so much of the time we are, we're under the impression that we always have to do more and be more. But, you know, I actually, I work three days a week. And part of the reason I do that is because to me, that was really important for my work-life balance. I have children. When they were younger, I wanted to be around for them. And now that they're a little bit older, I get to take time for myself. But I think that that's, there's no shame in that, right? I think so much of medicine, we think, well, we need to do it all and do more and do more. But honestly, I think it's really, really important to find that balance. Um, and it looks different for different people. Like some people may not feel the need to work a reduced schedule, but, but they make sure they take time in the evenings for themselves or on the weekends for themselves. And I just think that that's really important. And it is much harder now that, you know, we've become more interconnected because I am constantly able to access my patient charts and I'm constantly able to do messages. 10 years ago, I had to do the messages at the office. And when I walked away, I walked away. But now I do messages at home. I do messages in the evening. I do messages during my days off. And I have to remind myself, you know, at some point, you've got to carve out a little bit of time for this and then put it away because it'll follow you and it, it can it can take over your life. So you really just want to make sure that you decide what your balance is and then you honor that. Hi, so I have another question. Do you have any advice for high schoolers, like what uh, uh, they can do in high school to better prepare them for um, even college, maybe not medical school, um, and then uh, that would give them boost when they start to apply for medical school? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I'll tell you, I didn't do anything in particular. And I'm, I'm glad actually, but I mean, let me give you an example. So when I went to medical school, it turned out that some of my, um, some of my classmates in college had already taken like a gross anatomy lab and they had already taken microbiology. And so I looked around and I'm like, holy crap, like I'm behind, but it turns out I wasn't right. Because I learned that stuff. I learned that stuff in medical school, which is when I was supposed to learn it. And it turned out fine. But I did have those fleeting moments of thinking, gosh, well, maybe I should have done extra. Maybe I should have done this in advance so I would come in kind of knowing. But really, I think it's most important. I spent my formative years in college getting a liberal arts education where I learned not just material, but I learned how to think. And I think that that is the most important thing that you can do when you're in high school and college is learning broadly and learning how to think critically and how to ask questions. And I think you guys have all seen the pitfalls of people not being able to think critically in this past year and a half. And like hearing studies that are horrible saying incorrect things and, and going by them, you know? So learning how to think critically, um, I, I think that is more important than actually taking classes that will prepare you for the classes that you're gonna have to take anyway. Because to be truthful, like the stuff that we learn in medical school is really, really, really important to have a good foundation for when you go into residency and then when you become a physician. But what's more important, you don't need that foundation two or three times, right? But what you do need is to be able to look at data and analyze it properly and be able to understand how data applies to your individual patient as you're dealing with them in the real world. And that comes with learning how to think critically. So I think it's just really important that you take, you, you get a broad education where you learn critical thinking more than um, prepping with classes, if that makes sense. Um, I have another question. So yeah. I felt, not felt, um, dealt with like vaccine hesitant people in your work and like, how do you like overcome having to deal with those types of people? It's so 
difficult. It's so difficult. And I live in an area of the country where vaccine hesitancy is very strong. Um, and misinformation is very strong, right? Because I think everybody wants to do the right thing and they want to do the right thing for themselves and for society around them. They just, they're scared and they don't have all the data. And so it can be, I mean, I think you guys know there's, there's a ton of medical burnout right now. And then there's, um, there's a lot of compassion fatigue in, in medicine, in all medical professionals and physicians where it's just, it's, it's draining because this pandemic could have ended a lot sooner than it has if people would trust science, right? But you have to remind yourself that this is what it is and that people are really making the best decisions that they can so you can come at it from, uh, from, from compassion. Right. And so that can be hard, but it's really important to do. So I do my best to answer questions when people have them. I think it's really important to have a good rapport with people before you start trying to discuss things with them. Because if you don't know someone at all and you go in and start telling them that they need to be vaccinated, they're not going to listen to you because they don't know you. So I think having good rapport is really important as well. And then coming at it from understanding where they're coming from and then why they're hesitant. Um, and being compassionate about it rather than being frustrated. It can be hard to do, you know, but it's, it's really important. And that's the only way we're going to get through this is if we're compassionate towards each other. Okay. Um, if anyone else has any questions, make sure to unmute yourself or put them in the chat as well. Um, but have you ever faced, well, um, oh, so, someone said, how were you able to fund your college degree in medical school? So uh, it's variable from person to person what their, um, their economic situation is like. But I will tell you that Harvard has really incredible financial aid, really, really incredible financial aid. And then most people end up taking student loans, right? That's like a big thing. And those things have, those student loans have very low interest rates and you pay them off over time. And so I would say that that should not be the thing that is daunting um, about actually going forward and going into medicine because it is achievable. Okay, um, I was going to ask, uh, did you face any like challenges as a woman in medicine? And do you have any advice for girls who want to go into medicine? That's a great question. So, um, you know, there are studies that still say that in medicine and academic medicine, women are paid less than men, right? Um, there, that's, that's just known. And it's changing though, as more and more women are going into medicine. I feel lucky that I personally never really experienced sexism in the workplace like I never experienced any sexual harassment I really didn't experience or if I if somebody did say something it would I, nothing that I can remember which means it obviously didn't really strike me um I actually had my first child during my fellowship and um my program director made sure that I and then another fellow who also had a child at the same time had time carved out in our schedule to go pump breast milk for our kids so like, I feel like I went to a place that was very nurturing and supportive of women. And I think that that is going to continue to be the case. It, change happens by not allowing things to be. When, when you see something, you say something. When you experience something, you stand up and say, that's not okay. And um, it's evolving. But as more and more medicine, women go into medicine, I think this is going to be less and less the case. But there are still hurdles that we have to cross. And so we just have to really stand up for what's right. I had a quick question about um, just treating patients. So if you ever don't know how to treat a patient, what do you do? That's a great question. And I think one of the things that's important to note is that one of the greatest things about medicine is that we're lifelong learners, right? That things, and medicine evolves all the time as well. So something that used to be standard of care five years ago is no longer standard of care. So you get to keep learning and changing things and, and evolving with medicine. And we saw that in a very heightened way in this past year and a half with the pandemic, right? We saw 
how medicine has evolved, everybody saw it. And possibly that's what led to some distrust of medicine, but honestly, that's the way medicine's always been. And it's a good thing. But really, um, you look it up. You ask your colleagues, you look it up. I think it's really important too, when something is unusual, um, that you share that with the patient. That, because again, we talk about imposter you know, syndrome, but we are not expected to know everything, right? And so if something is extremely unusual, it's okay if it's something you haven't faced before. And if you say, hey, like this is something new to me, um, but here's my plan. I'm gonna reach out to this person or that person who I know is an expert in this field and gather some information and I'll get back to you. And that's okay. You know, I think that that's really, really important. You have to give yourself some grace in this because the worst case would be you just kind of wing it because you don't want to look stupid and then you end up causing harm. So, I mean, the number one thing is to do no harm in medicine. And the way you do that is by acknowledging when you're, you need to gain in some knowledge. So my last question is, do you have any overall advice when it comes to applying to medical school? I know you talked a lot about your experiences, but just like, I guess, like interviews or um, just the application process in general. Yeah, no, I think the number one thing, because I do interview for undergrads for Harvard. And so for interviews, I would say it's really important that you be yourself um, and that you project your truest sense of yourself and what you've accomplished because there are many times where I'll, I'll see an interview and or I'll, I'll see a person interviewing and I'll ask them questions about all this incredible stuff that they have on their resume that they clearly don't know much about you know so you might you obviously want to project the best side of yourself you can but you also don't want to pad your resume because it's very clear when someone doesn't, if you can't talk deeply about your research, right? If you've done research and that's in a big important part of your application, you got to know it backwards and forwards. You got to be able to talk about it because otherwise it looks like your dad did it for you or whatever, right? Um, so I think that that's really important when you're applying. I think it also really shows when people are passionate about things. So, you know, when people are applying to medical school, oftentimes they think they need to do all these things that are in a medical field, right? But, but really oftentimes medical schools and, and colleges, like they, they love seeing it if you're like passionate about the piano or passionate about you know, something non-medical because that your passion shows. And if you're interested in medicine and wanna put your heart into it, if they see that you're a passionate person about the things that you like, they know that you'll, you'll dedicate yourself to it and you'll do well. So I think, um, making sure you follow your heart is really, really important. How long did it take me to prepare for my MCAT? Oh my gosh, that was so long ago. <laughs> I think probably a summer. I think I took a whole summer and I did a Kaplan course if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I mean, that was a long time ago, guys. But I, I basically did the summer Kaplan course and studied all summer and then, and then took it afterwards. If that timing is right, now I don't even remember what time of year I took the MCAT, but I, I'm pretty sure I spent the summer studying for it. Okay, um, if anyone else has any questions before we end, you can unmute now, but I don't think anyone else has any questions. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for coming and spending your time with us, answering all our questions. I know it was a lot, um, but I really enjoyed all, everything that you had to say. No, I loved it. Thank you. It was great. It was, there were a lot of great questions and I'm just happy you guys are starting on this journey and I'm happy to be a resource for anybody that um, has questions. You can find me on Instagram and you can DM me on there. Um, and yeah, no, I'd be happy to answer any other questions as they come up. All right. Thank you so much. You're so welcome, guys.